So I'm here with Steve Hall. Steve Hall is a stand-up comedian writer. He was the first ever guest stand-up on Russell Howard's Good News and went on to write six series of that show. Um, he's also written for numerous comedians and Mock the Week and League of Their Own and The Now Show. And my accent, that's horrible, Now Show. <laughs> he's part of We Are Clangs alongside Greg Davis and Mark Larwood. And We Are Clang, or sorry, We Are Clang, sorry. I've already messed up the interview. There <laughs> we go. We're part of We Are Clang. We Are Clang was nominated for the Edinburgh Comedy Show Award for Best Show in 2016. And he's directed many, many critically acclaimed live shows, including 2007 Edinburgh Comedies Award. Nominated show, puppies. We could have went on there forever, yeah, Steve, yeah, so yeah. you've it's, done a lot. <laughs> yeah, it's, not, it's it's quite nice when you sort of look back on it and kind of go, fuck, I've actually done <laughs> some things that I'm not ashamed of. <laughs> some. Yeah, it's quite a relief. And it's, it's, it's always interesting because there are things that, like, like We Are Clang is, is now so long ago mm. that I can actually sort of look back on it and not cringe, like... It's like my kids have sort of, there was a weird thing where there's one clang bit on YouTube that in the last, literally this has happened in the last two months where uh, it had sort of laid it, you know, it would do all right numbers. And then all of a sudden in the last three months, it's doubled its numbers. Uh, so it's, it's a clip that's been up there since 2009. Um, and it's suddenly now getting near to a million. And it's doing the thing where it was suggesting it to me on my YouTube algorithm. <laughs> was it you, Steve? Was it yeah, just yeah. <laughs> well, it was because it came up on on like the YouTube on the telly. So it's oh, the wow. first time where like it came up and, our, and my kids were like going, "Is that you?" <laughs> but not fat. And, what uh, was the clip? Sorry, it's a, it's the it's probably our most successful bit that we did. So it's it's Love's Young Dream. Mm. Uh, so we we did. There used to be a show called Edinburgh and Beyond, where it would be people who'd done Edinburgh would do ten minute sets at the mm. Bloomsbury Theatre, and we did three of them and uh, in different series, and that was our most successful one. So it's mm. a, a song about our first kiss, um, and. Uh, at the time, I, I always felt like that was probably, of anything we filmed, that was probably the best thing that we did that most closely captured mm. the energy we had. And it was interesting because the bloke who directed that, Peter Orton, so like a legendary director, and he's done all of Russell Howard's, uh, mm. all the good news, all of the Russell Howard hour, did all of Fantasy Football League back in the 90s. So so it's like I'm sort of incredibly grateful that to him because he, uh, I think it was like his brilliance and just calm like captured what we do <laughs> is this the one where greg gives at the start is like we're going to do something unoffensive yeah yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. it was really good yeah, it was so, very so. strong well yeah. so can you describe for everyone that doesn't know what we are clang was so it was a three-man sketch show with sort of songs and stupidity mm. and the whole idea was we were the biggest losers in the room so we were three <laughs> absolute dickheads and the idea was that if we're the lowest status if we're obviously three brothers fighting in a sandpit that generally people weren't offended because it was always clear that we were rock bottom lowest status mm. and that that then opens up this area for play where the audience will sort of go with it. So it was very rare that we would cause offence. For a thing that is kind of nominally quite rude, mm. uh, the idea was always that it was joyful uh, and playtime and silliness. That video was so fun. Like that's the word. Just get in my yeah, head. I yeah, was like, yeah. they're having so much fun. Like you're like laughing at home, which yeah, is yeah, rare yeah. to laugh at a YouTube video. But you're genuinely like, what? What's yeah, going yeah. on? <laughs> and it was that nice thing where because you've sort of got a script, but you've also got room to either not really improvise so much, but to try and write a new joke to try and make the others laugh. Mm. So that was always the thing of it, us trying to make each other laugh. With, so when I'm telling Greg off, whatever middle name I give him, that can change each night. Oh, that's fun. Uh, and so, and so, and depending on the room, if you're doing late and live in Edinburgh, you can say something really <laughs> near the line. But then also, if you're doing uh, an afternoon kids show, you yeah. say something a bit sillier that's uh, that's going to work. So, so in fact, we did Fred McCauley's radio show in Edinburgh. We did, which is a, I think was it? No, it can't have been because it would have been. A disastrous thing to do on radio. It was doing something else, but we did a we did like an afternoon show where there were loads of kids in, mm. and because we have a sketch in which Marek was a dancing horse, uh, the kids loved that, and we knew this is exactly the right thing to do. 
uh, and so had a brilliant time with that, but then had to very strongly emphasise at the end of the show, do not bring your kids to see the actual evening <laughs> live show because that would be a terrible, terrible moment in your kid's childhood. You adapted the horse bit for the TV series as well? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and that was, I mean, it's it's interesting. We did, uh, sorry, I'll just, I'll no, have a, time. I don't want to bang the mic there. Uh, so, we, yeah, we did, so the history of our show mm. um we did a first Edinburgh show in 2004, uh, then did another show in 2005, which was like the first one where it was really good. Mm. <laughs> uh, so the, that fir- like the first year, was, we, we were very lucky. It was, it was kind of um, working with Christian Knowles and Joe King uh, and, and Avalon, and it was kind of like this co-production. And it would basically gave us the opportunity to get the shit out of the system mm. where it was, it was like experimental, but without the pretentiousness that that implies. <laughs> it was just learning how to sort of muck about together mm. on stage and direct. It, they were all directed by Logan Murray. Mm. And again, we can probably talk about him a bit. He's been, I've, I've interviewed him. Oh, oh, like oh, excellent. Tomorrow, oh so. brilliant. Yeah. He's very, very important mm. in the history of, of Clang. And so he directed all the shows and that was his real encouragement was learning how to play. So we then got nominated for the Edinburgh Award in 2006 and then nominated for the Barry Award in in what what was then called the Barry Award in, in Melbourne in 2007. And so that then meant we started to get bits and pieces of telly. Mm. Uh, so we did like a, a set on the – there was a 20th anniversary of Saturday Live and we did that where John Bon Jovi uh, – Bon Jovi's drummer. <laughs> bon Jovi's drummer really liked us, which we were very happy about. And so that ultimately led to our own series in 2009. Mm. But I don't – think that series is very good it was kind of a square peg in a round hole that we were trying we tried to fit in to a sitcom format and at the time the bbc were very keen on the idea of reviving variety there'd been Mm. a couple of things we'd done that had been along those lines a really good thing called music hall meltdown Mm. um it was directed by Jeff Posner and, and David Tyler had produced it. And again, they are like brilliant people in the history of British comedy. So it, it had proved that it could work, but the BBC were keen on these big, silly, daft things. And ultimately they achieved that on the sort of more interesting indie side with Miranda mm. and on the big shiny floor uh, BBC One primetime side with Mrs. Brown's Boys. Mm. Uh, and interestingly, the bloke who directed the Clang series directed all of Mrs. Brown's boys. Oh. And so they were trying to fit us into this thing and we didn't have the courage to say no. Mm. Um, and, and and ultimately it doesn't work because you can see we're trying to crowbar things in. And there are bits that are, there are bits of it that I don't mind, mm. but ultimately like it, it it's a failure, mm. I think. Um, and so it, it's interesting where there are sketches. So the dancing all sketch is what a bit that I don't mind so much. Mm. Um, it's more when I look back on it, it's just a fucking mess. Um, but I, I also that was my design. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I also think it's very useful. Like so, with Greg's stuff, Greg's subsequent stuff that he's done being brilliant. Mm. It's almost like I think we all learnt lessons, mm. uh, and and when we're, we're, we're not blaming anyone there as well. Mm. We we are as much at fault for it being bad. There's no resentment to to anyone else. It was just we didn't really know what we were doing. It was just learning, I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. Um, how was we are clang formed? Uh, so we all did. We all met. Uh, it was kind of so we all started on the open spot circuit, mm. uh, and most of us met. We did the first ever Amuse Moose course. Mm. So I, so I'd been living in London uh, and was very bored uh, <laughs> and uh, uh, and just getting drunk all the time. I was a, I was having this real sort of long dark night of the soul of thinking, <laughs> what am I? What am I doing? I've always wanted to live in London, and I'm just. Were you doing working nothing. at the, the bank that will not be named? Yes, stage? yeah, 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 that's exactly <laughs> it. And uh, uh, and um, I saw a thing advertised in Time Out uh, that was this comedy course specifically taught by Logan Murray. And the reason I, that caught my eye was I had used to go as a comedy fan to see these new material nights uh, at the Fortnite Club that were mm. often hosted by Logan mm. doing his character Ronnie Rigsby. Mm. So I, I absolutely love Ronnie Rigsby. Very funny. Just, Only one, one yeah. video on YouTube I could find yeah. it. It was hilarious. <laughs> and again, that spirit of play and just the freewheeling nature of it, it was mm. really brilliant. And I'd also seen, when I was 18 or 19, I'd seen him do an Edinburgh preview of his double act with Jerry Sadowitz. Mm. And that was... It, unbelievable and it was he was kind of the only person i've ever been aware of who is able to who was able to work with sadowitz in a constructive way mm. where you know and i can see on stage logan is making jerry laugh 
so that was th- that kind of excitement of where and I've still I've met Sadowitz like for like 30 seconds in my life, <laughs> uh, and I can't imagine a longer conversation would necessarily <laughs> be the easiest of experiences but yeah so so that was it it was like well if I don't do this now I'm never going to do this and because it was Logan um, I thought let's give it a bash and then of the 20 or so people assembled for that first ever course uh, taught by Logan. It included me, Greg Davis, Rod Gilbert, Ed Petrie, who went on to uh, host the Broom Cupboard on Children's BBC for many <laughs> years, and is a bit of a legend of children's broadcasting. Uh, Alexis Jubas, who does Marcel Lucant. Uh, Aisha Hazarika, who is now on Times Radio. Um, and it was, and there's there's Cy Thomas, who's a very excellent comedian and, and sketch performer. So there were loads of them. Uh, and he, and like a few people who like stayed on. So there's a really lovely bloke called Rob Collins who sort of ran a few gigs for a while and, and was on the circuit. And I think he's now packed it in. Mm. But we were incredibly lucky. There were so many of us. Oh, and Sean James, who was a bit of a legend of the uh, of the circuit as well. So it was you know twenty strangers beneath, meeting once a week beneath a bar, and then suddenly you you end up making friends out of that. And then we do our first gig, and it's suddenly it's like, oh my god, this is so exciting. We've got a <laughs> ready made gang. Uh, and so Rob, at the time, Rob Collins was running a pub uh, on the Strand. So he put on a, a regular night there, and that became our first little playground. And so that's all just doing stand-up. Mm. And then you become friends. Then Marek Larwood did the third ever Moose course. So he, you know, and at the time, like, we've been going four months longer than him. It's felt <laughs> like, oh, welcome, Junior, when you've been in the game as long as we have. <laughs> And then um, <laughs> we did, we did like a, in two thousand and two, we went out to Edinburgh for a week because I like we we got into some of the new act finals, mm. uh, and then did in two thousand and three we did a four hundred in the days before the free fringe mm. we did C venues and it was which, which we didn't know at the time it was like mostly for students so at that point in our late twenties we felt <laughs> very old and that was me Greg Rod and Ed Petrie. And we'd invited Marek to do it, but he didn't have the money at the time, so, so he he stayed home and worked. Uh, but we that had been a lot of fun. And so towards the end of that year, Marek was saying, why don't we see if we can get – I'd signed with Avalon by this point, mm-hmm. and, and uh, Marek was saying, can we see if Avalon or someone could book us in like a tour, but like a fuckabout tour? And he wanted it to be me, him, and Greg, mm-hmm. but just like doing a fortnight of gigs wherever would have us, mm-hmm. but sort of mucking about and seeing what happened. So it wasn't even necessarily sketches mm-hmm. at that point. And then uh, just fill the stage time with yeah, yeah, good. yeah, <laughs> which is slightly arrogant. Given that we, we, ba- we barely had a twenty at that point, and we're like going, "Yeah, that'll be." It. I'm sure an audience will fucking love that. <laughs> and uh, so we then um, a brilliant woman called Charlie Briggs, who had done various brilliant things in comedy. She said to us, "Well, look, how about instead of that, how about I book you some nights in some theatre spaces in in London, and you you do that." So it was like the 30th of December, 2003. Mm. We were on, she booked us in for an hour. We shared a, a night with Colin and Fergus, who were brilliant as well. Um, and that was the first the first thing we ever did. And it was like a mixture. I, I sort of semi-compared that. And, and it was like more, because I'm not an actor. It was more Marek and Greg doing a few sketches and me chipping in if they needed a third person. Mm. And that was where it sort of, we kind of went, hang on, we're onto something here because me sort of playing the nominal straight man against these big personalities worked. So Charlie then kept booking us in for more and more nights and, and suddenly they started to go okay. Mm. Uh, and then, so then in April that year, it became a chat of like, well, should we try and do Edinburgh? And I knew me and Marit were going to do the Comedy Zone um, uh, that year, which obviously doesn't exist anymore, but... Mm. Uh, was a big showcase in the Pleasance Courtyard and had been running since like 1991. Mm. And it was the thing people wanted to get in on. Mm. It was like a, a lot of, talked to a lot of comics, they had never really thought beyond if I can be in the comedy zone with mm. the history it had. Mm. That was the most exciting thing. So I knew I was going to be in Edinburgh doing that. So we thought, let's just, let's book it in. And uh, it was a really interesting thing where we didn't get too many reviews. We got a review in the stage that described us as annoying, silly, and just plain dull. Dull? Oh, yeah, that's not yeah, fair. Yeah. I'm, I'm and angry. Then, uh, <laughs> and then one year later, the stage reviewed us and said they might be the perfect sketch. <laughs> so this is it shows you that reviews are not uh, all that important. Um, and, and it was interesting. On that fi- The final night of that Edinburgh run, we sold three tickets. 
but we walked in or on passes 47 people so we had we had a full 50 seater and it was all it was mostly people in some way connected to comedy so dave ward who went on to be in the the sitcom and he gave us some really excellent advice and he, there's a, 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 a the callback that is at the end of the love's young dream song mm. uh, on youtube he suggested that callback to oh. us so so we were always very grateful to him and it, but it was people like him and Christian Knowles sort of saying like, okay, well, we like we like what you're doing. Mm. So that that then led to us doing student unions mm. where Greg would compare, I would do a set, Marit would do a character, and then we would headline as the uh, as the sketch show. Oh, smart. And, yeah, and it became like split only having to split the money three ways. You'd make like an extra thirty quid. <laughs> so it was, and these were days where it was like. We were so skint in those days that mm. I have a memory of we did Lancaster Student Union and Marrick and Greg had, had booked a hotel and it, had resigned themselves to the fact that they were going to lose money on the round <laughs> trip. Whereas I'd found a coach that was passing through Lancaster going back to London at like 2.30 in the morning. So, so it meant that my profit margin was 17 quid. And I'm stood freezing uh, by, by, by this, hoping that this coach is going to appear. And these two strangers come up to me. And like One of them kind of goes, well, well, looks like we found ourselves a drifter. Oh, and one of them goes, do you, want a, do you want a bite of my burger, drifter? Oh, no. And I was so hungry. I went, yes, please. <laughs> so, and it turned out they were actually quite nice blokes. But it was, that was, it was chaotic, <laughs> but incredibly useful that we, it was that real camaraderie built up mm. of doing these gigs. And some of those gigs would be like fucking tricky. So <laughs> we did Liverpool uh, Student Union, and there were three tables that were just all on Coke, mm. uh, and, and <laughs> which changes the dynamic when they're, and, but it meant that we could then be, because there's three of us, we can be a bit more aggressive. Than we might otherwise be if we were <laughs> on our a own. Triangle. <laughs> so it was this rule like, well, f- all right then, fucking come on. <laughs> and, uh, and weirdly, years later, I found out that the first gig that Kiri Pritchard McLean ever went to as a student, first comedy night she ever went to, was that gig. <laughs> so, she, so she was re- she'd remembered the the chaos of that. Wow. So I was like, going, did we do it? And she was going, oh no, you won. You, you always won. <laughs> and she thankfully she wasn't on the cocaine tables. <laughs> but yeah, so so it was this kind of. It was really sort of chaotic way we all got together, mm. and then it it slowly turned into like okay, well we're actually in a position where this is now quite good, mm. and there is potentially, you know, it's not not necessarily money to be made. Mm. You know, you're not thinking in those terms, but you're thinking this isn't pointless. There is there is a this is a worthwhile thing to do. Mm. And how were you riding for that as a group? I mean, we never really found a good way. We, like, <laughs> it was ag- aggressive organic would be the, uh, the, the way that I always felt that it worked better if we arrived with nothing and, and mm. we start and we try to fuck about together. Like if one, if someone, I always thought if someone brought a sketch, uh, it was a bit tricky because um, they're a bit too wedded to it and mm. you're not, you know they're defensive. If you if if you pitch a thing and you, and the others don't like it, mm. you're suddenly like, well, fuck you, you're wrong. <laughs> so I always thought the ones that work best were when we started with us. And so there are a couple of days where I'd said, let's just go round Camden Market mm. and like let's buy shit mm. and like anything that makes us laugh and see what we can do with that. So uh, or like drunk purchases on eBay and let's bring stuff. So <laughs> so that was the, the what, like Greg had bought and this is in the days that rubber horse's head you now see everywhere. Yeah. But when we first did that, like it wasn't everywhere. It was mm. like Greg had found it somewhere and it was like going, I've got this and it made me laugh, but I've got no clue what to do with it. Mm. Uh, and that day I'd been listening to Echo and the Bunny Men who have a song called Bring On The Dancing Horses. So that was it. If I, It's like those two things. If Greg hadn't randomly seen this thing, I think on eBay, mm. and if I hadn't happened to listen to Echo and the Buddy Men mm. that day, uh, and, and so it then became like, okay, well, let's do that. But then we didn't have an end point in sight, and it was doing it at the King's Head that night where we suddenly went, uh, like it, it, but it was all that was where it felt amazing that there was a telepathy to it. That it was we were getting the audience to shout out suggested dances, and then the idea of like, oh, let's just try and fucking knacker him out, <laughs> and, that, and that's the gag is we're just we are this sketch is is a tool to bully uh, our friend, and then Marrick gets it as well, and so and because if we're not we're not actually bullying the real person, it's yeah. uh, and 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 he's and even the double takes so when he's. 
when when someone suggests an ultra energetic dance, mm-hmm. Marek can do an ex, you know, an uh, an exaggerated double take in the horse's head. That's uh, magical. And so it is that thing. It's like trying to be open to as many different avenues of of joke mm. where so some of it's written and some of it you'd go away and sort of go okay i've i've, I've now that we've got the framework I, here's a one liner that could mm. go in but also you you're looking to how is the dynamic on stage what's the funniest way of mm. reflecting the dynamic and then fun appears as well as you said when you're on the stage when you're messing mm. about with the lines and yeah. stuff just to throw so, it yeah, yeah. that's so fun that's so, like- so even like yeah with the, like the love's young dream song for a long time i think for the entirety of that edinburgh run mm. i did i realized i was like getting greg to explain his bit but i wasn't then saying to Marek, and you set off a speed camera tw- uh, you set off a speed camera um and that arrived like one of the first gigs we did after edinburgh i was like oh hang on i've like there I, it's one of my big obsessions with like whatever form i'm writing in mm. it's looking for the spaces where jokes can go um and just look like where what can be expanded and some in some cases it might be like okay if i put a joke in here it actually ruins the flow of the whole thing mm. but you can always find a space there was always in, in one of the sketches where greg would say why are you so happy and i and i would say it's in the dancing horse sketch, and my character would say i'm i'm happy because i've got a dancing horse mm. but then i realized i can say i'm happy for two reasons thing number one something Mm. irrelevant to the plot thing number two <laughs> thing number two i've got a dancing horse mm. and so and again that thing could change so so uh um again it would be like it could be like uh i'm happy because i'm on glue and it could be <laughs> something as throwaway as that but late and live uh we could say i'm happy for two reasons uh reason number one i'm an active member of the national front <laughs> thing number two i've got a dancing horse and and so you, it's like finding the space for a joke uh, and, yeah, and again, that so the joke itself can change, mm. um, and that brings joy to them. And yeah, that yeah, yeah. To the room. That's that's very yeah. cool. And and it's always doing that. It's always looking for where is a little extra thing that you can. How can you squeeze the value? Mm. So if I'm working, if I'm directing a show, I'm always. That's one of my big things is say, and it's where, where you're not prescribing what the joke should be, but mm. you're sort of saying, I think there's a thing. If you explain this. You know, you can sort of go, now, you, you might not all know what this thing is, mm. so let me tell you what it is, and then there's the space for a joke. Mm. So I read um, in one of your descriptions as you direct a lot of Edinburgh shows, and it was a funny line, but it was going from one star to three star. Yeah, yeah, that was, yeah, yeah. That's, uh, <laughs> and so it's, it's always an interesting thing where, it, yeah, it's been very different experiences where I've worked with some really successful things, or where I've been brought on early enough that it's it's flat because I, I never really go in search i've never i very re- i don't think i've ever advertised my services mm. as a director it's always been someone Please getting help. in touch <laughs> so so um so for example so so this was not in a rescue mm. mission but uh, christian knowles mm. who at the time was managing norris and parker and tom ward and christian uh, got in touch and said I, i've uh, do you want to meet up with Tom and with Norris and Parker mm. and just see if see if there's a chemistry there mm. and there, and that really was and so both with both of them that was like very early on in the process and uh, it, I absolutely loved so I did I directed Tom's first two shows um and it was I was obviously like he's a he's a special talent mm. and some of that becomes it, it's interesting it becomes different things that, so with some people it, there's an element of pastoral care mm. where you're trying to just keep them focused and not let the the the, the bullshit of Edinburgh affect them negatively psychologically, um, and so so with things like that, they're just it's a joy to work with. And similarly, I did Pappies the in two thousand and seven when they got nominated, but with that show, I didn't think they actually needed a lot. Like I did that for free just because mm. I loved those boys so much, and um, uh, it was very obvious at the time that the show was almost perfect when I first saw it. And with that, it was more like because that was in the time where Clang were Flavor of the Month. Mm. So that it felt like it was like an element of like the uh, an element of patronage, but there's a there's got to be a better word than patronage. But it felt like uh, this is Clang's moment, but mm. so so we're trying to pay it forward to the next brilliant mm. thing coming through. And I was also aware that I knew they were great, so I, <laughs> I, I was I would hopefully look a bit cool. 
by, uh, by working with them. And how does that, uh, how does to, the process work? Sorry, when you, like they, in that case, do you just watch the whole show and take notes? Yeah, yeah. So it's, it, it's, I'll ask people to send me recordings wherever possible. I always, I basically try and massively over deliver time work. <laughs> so, so I'll get people to send me recordings because then I can listen to it loads and loads of times. Mm. Bec- and you sort of need that to fully get into the, where you can, because you know, when you're on the circuit, even your good friends, mm. you might only gig with them twice a year. Mm. And so you don't get an accurate reflection of like w- the way they deliver a line. It might be that they're just on that one night they delivered the line a slightly weird way or the mm. audience reacted a bit odd. Whereas when you've listened to eight recordings, you can say, okay, you always deliver this line in a slightly aggressive way and it never quite gets what you want. Mm. Have you thought about changing that, either rewriting it or just softening your delivery mm and see what see what happens so that it was that kind of thing mm. uh and then obviously you're, you're then looking at the structure and suggest you know suggesting does it flow or does mm. it make sense narratively mm. and so on but yeah it's it's it was always that thing of i think if someone's paying you to direct them within comedy i always hate i slightly shudder at the word directing mm. in terms of comedy because you know plays need directing often with comedy it's more you are a creative consultant and you're basically someone is paying you to be completely honest mm. but uh, and particularly if you if there's someone you don't know they like we've all got some of our closest friends in comedy we might not feel we can be fully honest with them because you might have that moment like going, he, he fucking loves that bit and it, it, all, <laughs> it always dies on its ass and no, he doesn't realise. But if I tell him, it's going to upset him and it'll be an argument. So do I let him work it out over time? Good or, job. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so it's, as a director, it is just directly saying to someone, that bit does not work mm-hmm. or that bit is wrong for these reasons or you don't realise this but when you say this word people are thinking that you're going to be you're about to be misogynistic or whatever it might be and it is being paid to be brutally honest but that's so useful for the yeah yeah right? and, and so it's it's um and when someone and that's where you can tell when someone takes that note well you're like okay well this is someone i know i can work with so i've, I've done a few things with chris turner over the years who, who i love working with and he he's always very receptive to a note mm-hmm. even if he doesn't agree with it he will sort of try and see it from where i'm coming from and, and really make steps to sort of think okay well how yeah how can i address that note and still stay true to what he his, his vision of the show is yeah, so there'll be shows like that, but then there are also, yeah, every now and then there are shows where it's like the it's like the twentieth of July. And you, you get a <laughs> phone call, and uh, yeah, there were one or two over the years where it's like it's it's tricky because you're like, okay, well, th- you know, if I'd have spoken to this person in um, in March, I could have helped. But as it is, you just have to sort of go, okay, well, let's, you know, how do we patch up this dinghy? <laughs> And a similar process, just review all the footage. And then yeah, yeah, so, yeah, expand. and just and in some cases, just saying to them, like, you ha- again, in terms of the blunt, blunt honesty, you're saying like, you you are in an element of shit here, <laughs> and uh, and we've had that, we've had that with Clang, where um, our the sh- the year we got nominated, mm. the first couple, the, we weren't ready, the show was not ready when we came up, and so Logan came up to Edinburgh. Uh, um, which was incredibly kind of him. And we took the first three shows. We were able to keep the reviewers out for the first three shows and and made the changes, dropped a sketch that wasn't working, brought something in that had just that hadn't quite made the cut mm. and that it would save the day. Mm. But it's a, I've actually I've done Logan's course myself, so I'm interested to hear obviously it's evolved over the years, but uh, when he comes up to help as a director, is he just like run it through and have fun? Or is he is, is still a fun self uh, or does he go yeah, more? It's still fun and it's still lots of like, yeah, mm. run it, but he he's he is thinking about and he and he's actually he's actually good at blocking and and, mm. and th- proper theatrical direction. Mm. But he, yeah, his whole thing was like staying true to ourselves. Mm. So, so you know, what is the dynamic, and like, what? How are the audience reacting to what we're doing? So, it's like if someone if someone is too aggressive within the dynamic of the three, mm. the audience are like, oh, steady on. So, I remember there was one year where, in you know, one of the sketches, I start in a coma, and <laughs> um, Marek won one uh, one week through in one show, he threw a, a pint of water over me, and you, and the audience were like, oh. 
and it, it, and it felt it was it was weird that even that within our prescribed rules where we're kids fighting in a sandpit, mm. the audience were like, "Oh, that's a bit mean." Because it was, <laughs> is that a cool? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and um, and so that was an interesting thing mm. where, and, so that, and that's yeah, Logan was great with that of like, what is you know preserving the right element so mm. it's it's play and it's teasing but how do you preserve the twinkle in the eye mm. That's cool. which again and that was again which crosses over with him working with Sadowitz where mm. um because again jerry the the the, the edinburgh preview that i went to uh of, of of the bib and bob show that he did with Sadowitz, uh a member of the audience said to to jerry fucking Sadowitz, why don't you fuck off back to oxbridge he thought that Jerry Sadowitz was a member of the Cambridge. <laughs> and so Sadowitz is on stage pissing himself laughing at first because he's like, but like, he's like, going, I, like, he's like going, I spent my childhood in the gorbals having the fuck kicked out of me. And you think I went to Oxford or Cambridge? <laughs> and he then spat on the member of the audience. So it's, like, it's un like, like, yeah. As a, yeah, little 19 year old comedy nerd, I'm thinking, this is, this is amazing. But it, it Logan was able to help walk the gig back into the light mm. and 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 it remained charming mm. and uh it was yeah amazing to watch but that yeah so he was always brilliant at that that well, kind of good you were receptive to feedback as well because you could use you yeah, yeah, yeah. awards yeah. we don't yeah. need a director <laughs> well let's take it back to your stand up if you don't mind um so your first gig was at the showcase for the comedy of course um not quite because so i i had done uh, taking it way back, mm. one of my best mates at school was a brilliant comedian and writer called Mark Haynes. Um, and we'd always been comedy fans and we'd always known we'd quite like to try stand up at some point. Uh, but it had been, you know, we were too scared. Um, and we used to swap letters. He was at, at, at Leeds University and, and I would, we'd swap letters. And he then did a stand-up gig and he used some jokes that I'd put in one of my letters to him. Mm. So it was incredibly flattering. Mm. And he was like, oh, you know, this is like the best drug I've ever done. The, you know, the, adre <laughs> the adrenaline of it is, you know, you've got to do it. If, you know, even if you just treat it like a bungee jump, mm. um, you know, what an experience. And he, he then entered one of the new act competitions. So the Daily Telegraph Open Mic Award, mm. he entered that and got into the final. So we went up to Edinburgh in, in 1998 for a couple of days to see that final. And in that final, you had people like Dan Antopolsky, Jeff Whiting, Stephen Grant, uh, Stephen Merchant wow. uh, was in it, and Mark won it. Uh, and and it was one of these things. We, it was a real like where our Edinburgh sort of got flipped upside down because we, we we'd kind of thought like, oh, this is a bit of fun, and yeah. and then suddenly he's getting like nonstop like, you know, we're gonna make you a star, <laughs> um, and he was kind of quite freaked out. And then he didn't massive. He did. He then did a couple of stand up gigs and didn't love it. So to this day, I think he's done fewer than 30, 30 stand up gigs mm. because it was like it wasn't. He didn't like the travel. He didn't like the sort of the loneliness of the lifestyle. And so he's now like a, uh, he's one of Richard Bacon's uh, closest uh, associates, so like writes for Richard Bacon and wow. things like that. So he's, he, and he's had like a long and fruitful career doing lo mm. lots of stuff. Uh, but at the time, he, there was like some gigs when he was deciding he wasn't quite fancying it. Mm. He got me, he, he asked me to fill in. <laughs> uh, and so, it was a bit literally like at an open spot gig. So it, it, in between 98 and 99, I did maybe a dozen gigs. Mm. Um, and the, fir the first one of those lasted a minute and a half <laughs> and finished with me saying, I don't think I'll be doing this again. <laughs> and it really was just for like the, let's just do this and see how it feels. Um, and so I'd done a handful of them and it, I hadn't, it had been an interestingly, un I'd, I'd enjoyed it, but it had also been, it had felt very cliquey and very confusing. And like, I don't exactly know what this is. And at the time you had people either just directly copying Eddie Izzard mm. or people trying to be, I'm an edgy motherfucker, trying, <laughs> trying to be Bill Hicks. And so you'd, you'd sort of see this and it would, you'd end up thinking, well, I don't know, I, I, I can't be as good as the people who I think are brilliant, but also I, I worry that I'm as self-deluded <laughs> as some some of the people I've watched. Uh, and so I then didn't go anywhere near stand up for a couple of years, and, and then that, and then it was it, so that was why the the moose course finally then became like this. I will like it's now or never. You are you know you're either gonna scratch this itch for mm -hmm. good, 
or, or just or, or never try again and always regret it. Little did you know you were joining one of the strongest cohorts. Yeah, yeah, ex- yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, so, and then that was the thing that within the first couple of weeks of that course, it was like, oh, this is the best decision I've made, <laughs> where we were just laughing so much. And also, it's inevitably quite flattering if people think that you're good. Mm. It's incredibly exciting. So the first time I realised that Greg Davis thinks I'm funny or, or Ed Petrie thinks I'm funny, that's so flattering. Mm. And so, yeah, it, then we did the showcase gigs, um, which are, again, and they're, they're almost slightly, they're almost a bit of a, a false positive because mm. they are so lovely <laughs> that you sort of like, and is this, is this real? Um, Just asking Logan, Logan, how do I get signed after yeah, the showcase? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I remember that when, when I um, came off after that first showcase gig, Logan said to me, uh, you've got an amazing career ahead of you. Wow. Which it's like, I still fucking get tingles when I think of that. Um, <laughs> And and so that was the thing that it was, it then and then that led to like well okay well where are the gigs how do we find more gigs mm. and so that led to so Rob Collins at his pub the Nell Gwyn he then um, uh, put on regular yeah. nights and that's a funny pub to go back into because when like at the time when you're doing it it feels like a massive room <laughs> and then when you walk past it's a fucking tiny pub that, uh, and yeah and it was just and that's where like you know you start doing laughing horse gigs and in within that year Greg won the laughing horse competition that year. Uh, and in fact, he he was so low on self belief mm. in those sense. I went to all his heats, and the semi final, um, he had been on quite early and thought he hadn't done well enough. And I I had no doubt mm. that he was going to win. So I he'd got me to record it, and this is in the days of like the chunkier <laughs> recorders. So I'd record I'd recorded his set for him, and when they were announcing the winners. I, I pressed record on that because I knew wow. they were going to say his name. And he still got it somewhere. So, so it's his name being read out. And then me said to the camera, how about that then? <laughs> well, 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 well. <laughs> so it was th- that excitement at that. And then and then I got into the Daily Telegraph Open Mic Award of 2002, mm-hmm. that final, uh, that Mark Watson won. And again, that's where... In the you know the, when you're in Edinburgh for that, again, you're getting extra gigs here mm-hmm. and there. And so that's when agencies like Avalon start saying, well, do you want to do our student union gigs? Mm. And so you're so there. And it feels like it's one of those things. It feels like at the time that it takes ages. Mm. The, reali- the reality is it's 18 months, mm. but um, it felt, you know, you, like you're, well, you're nervously checking. <laughs> like in those days, well, like, I remember Greg confessing that like he would look at, because you could have, people could comment on your chortle review Oh, wow. uh, and 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 they might appear. And so he was, you know, he confessed to me that like he would look like three times a day to see if any <laughs> new comments have been added. And I'd say to him, I do exactly the same. <laughs> you were uh, you were doing Instagram before. Yeah, Instagram yeah exactly. Existed. Yeah, yeah. It's like it's like t- it's like checking yourself on Twitter. <laughs> um, but from the start, that well, obviously from the course, then were you thinking, okay, I'm going to try to be a professional comedian? No, no. At the time, it was just like I was one of the, one of the things that had got me to do it was I been through like a bad breakup and it was a real like <laughs> the uh, classic. yeah it was so it is every cliche it? so it was this real like well i don't need her i'm gonna show her i'm gonna make 30 drunk people laugh for four and a half minutes at me yeah, yeah. and um uh, yeah and so it was it was just fun and it was such a it was such a joyful gang to be part of like rod at the time was working for like a market research agency and they had an office in Soho. Mm. So I remember there was a big couple of nights where you do a gig and then you could have like a late night drink at, at Rod's workplace because mm. um, it was like quite a funky Soho establishment. Mm. It was the sort of place where they had a meeting room where you could just talk bollocks and get drunk into the small hours. Um, and there was a gig, I, I had no idea I was being paid for it, that I'd done, I'd done a, an open spot. Uh, in uh, in Cricklewood, mm-hmm. uh, and and the woman who was running it said, "Oh, would you want to come back and do 10? Mm-hmm. So I did that, and I had no idea that that was. And she she'd run clubs in the eighties, so she was very much on, on the the socialist principles of the early <laughs> uh, the, of the early circuit. So she was like, "No, you're doing a half spot, so you get paid." So I got I got twenty two quid, <laughs> and um, and I, some mates of mine had come come along to that. Mm-hmm. So I spent it all. I I bought us all kebabs at the end of the night, wow. and it was like. I was like, I just bought my mates kebabs. This is, <laughs> and that bit was the first inkling of like, oh, hang on a second, this is, I wouldn't mind this. Mm. And then, um, yeah, and then, but still, where well, you sort of know you're vaguely onto something, but you're almost not allowing you. You don't dare to th- to think that you could be up mm. 
that there's an escape. Yeah, the, yeah, the, the and, or that this could be an actual living. It always felt like, okay, well, this is a laugh, and actually, it's like it's helped me drink less, which was <laughs> which was something that was bothering me at the time, and also that yeah, that you're having a great night out and you're being paid for it mm. rather than and you've got your friends that are coming yeah, along yeah. with you. Um, so when did you finally quit the? the so bank I job? then I got made redundant. <laughs> it was the best thing that uh, happened. There was the, this entire of the bank that will not be named. They were selling off our entire building, got mm. sold off, and so everyone got made redundant. So it was a it was a like culturally like anthropologically fascinating time where three hundred people knew they were losing their job, uh, and the different ways that they all handled it. Mm. So because there'd been some people who'd been in the same building for twenty five years, mm. so there's literally like people like punching each other or like confessing love. So there's like there's literally like there's like. Like you know, people banging in the cubicles, like like it was. What's the point? Yeah, yeah, it was, it was, it was, it was wonderfully chaotic. Um, and how were you reacting? Yeah, you just well, like, well, yeah. So I was just, and I hadn't been there that long, so mm. so I knew the thing that I was excited about was I knew that the little redundancy payout mm. I was going to get meant I could definitely do Edinburgh mm. and not have to worry too much, and mm. so that was. Uh, yeah, that was early two thousand and three that that happened, which meant that we could the, so that the the three men in a giant show we could do that, and I could be like, okay, well, I can actually not have to work in June and July, so I can I can make sure that I'm writing. Mm. Uh, and then and and then in that two thousand and three, the BBC New Act final was that year, mm. and that happened in Edinburgh, and Rod won that, and me and Greg Cook, uh, God rest his soul. Um, uh, we were both runners up, mm. so suddenly it's this weird little coup for our tiny little new act show in in C venues, mm. where we've got the winner and one of the runners up mm. uh, are, are in that show. So 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 weirdly, that show then ended up breaking even mm. because we were selling well enough. Oh, well, that must have been a magical moment then when you realised you could break even. Yeah, and yeah, and it was yeah, and it really <laughs> was like this where people are going, "What the fuck?" Like the other comments going, "What? Who have you fucking bribed for this?" Like, <laughs> <laughs> How have you managed this? And we were, yeah, just like aware that we'd got lucky. There were a few decisions we'd made. Like we'd, we basically started as early as we could. So mm. there was a, like a week zero in Edinburgh on a night where there were hardly any shows up. Mm. We got two reviewers in because they want the reviewers wanted to get going. So we got we got a four star review in the Metro mm. very early on, which meant like okay, we're we're at the races with this. Mm. Yeah, it's very strong to start when no one yeah. else has a review. Yeah. Um, how do, to, what advice would you give to people going up to Edinburgh now? Uh, it's interesting because I've not done it for a while, so so mm. obviously, obviously the game has changed. Mm. Uh, <laughs> it's my day. <laughs> but um, the best advice I was ever given, David O'Doherty said to me, um, "Remember that it's a month, mm. uh, and that any month of your life n has shit days, mm. for, and and like for no reason that mm. you know that it's you, you know you sleep badly or." Uh, you're a tiny bit hungover or uh, you've had a bad phone call with a relative or whatever it might be. And so no month of anyone's life is perfect. There's always days that are – and so that whether a show – if a show is amazingly brilliant mm. or a show is amazingly shit, this too shall pass. <laughs> uh, and so it, it it really is that thing. So so just that thing of looking after yourself mm. for the month. And, and so it was when, uh, when Blur were at the height of their fame uh, – <laughs> Alex James had a policy where every Wednesday he wouldn't – whatever they were doing, he would be – every Wednesday he would be completely sober mm. and he would phone his grandma, like mm. things like that. He would do those little bits of uh, self-care mm. but also just calm uh, that would help him uh, not go completely loopy. Mm. Uh, and so, yeah, I – treating Edinburgh like like you're in blur <laughs> at the height of their success because you, you see it with certain people and it like I'm always fascinated you never know who it's going to be where there are people who it suddenly becomes apparent that they would that they really thought they were going to win best newcomer or something mm -hmm. like that and often it's like Sometimes you get people who post things on Facebook and it'll be like a lengthy paragraph written in early September about like their reflections on the month that they've had. And we're like, I'll be honest, I was so gutted when I saw the, you know, the nominations come out. And you're like, oh, oh, right. I had no, and you, and you had no clue mm. that that's how they were thinking. Mm. Um, and so it really is just, just, it, it's utter chaos. And so, <laughs> and so enjoy it, but, mm. but just try to be self aware with it. Mm. And, uh, yeah, not like don't don't worry too much about 
and it's difficult because because like the, the moment we became aware that the judges were sniffing around us inevitably mm. like going oh that'd be that'd be pretty cool <laughs> but um but yeah it's but that is the biggest thing it's mm. just it's a month and and like to the point where like uh, the american comics when they when they do edinburgh they are openly laughing at the insanity <laughs> of that festival being a month long because you sort of know who the winners and losers are yeah. uh, after after the first fortnight. And obviously this is one of the key ways it's changing is that you get – there are now people, loads more people not doing the full run. Mm. And it's that seems to work, particularly because – the whole the expense of it and the and the 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 rent situation in Edinburgh mm. is so is so repulsive at the moment that mm. I don't know how much sense it makes anymore, uh, and, and I'm glad I'm glad it's not a decision I have to worry <laughs> too much about because yeah. but but the, and this is the way that it's changed now that, mm. that obviously having a presence having a following before you do Edinburgh mm. is is really important now. Mm. And that you know, that was never the case when we mm. were first doing it. So if you were to be made redundant today and you were in the same sort of era with your comedy, what would you would you have done anything different? Uh so as in if I was new starting it, now. When you were made I'm trying to this is gonna be a long <laughs> It's all good. No I, I, as if so you were back to where you were at your comedy stage, like you've just been you've done the competitions and stuff, you've got the the trio. Yeah. Um and then you're made, you're working at the bank, but then you're made redundant. Like, what would be your strategy if you were at that level of comedy? But it um, happened now. If it happened now, I think we would probably be more uh, tech savvy. Mm. So, so that was the thing, and that's one of the key that I'm. Uh, I'm, you know, I was of a generation where I, I'm still shit with me with social media in general. Mm. Um, that we would, you know, I think that we we would be aware that we would be filming the stuff mm. and sort of trying you to. You would it. have amazing footage. Oh my god! The, yeah, the, oh, it would be wonderful. Yeah, and so, like, like we've got like the for example, the, we have a live show that we never released, mm. uh, and the rights just returned to us uh, a year or two ago, um, and I don't know whether we, whether we'll do anything. I, if we do put it anywhere, I I would like to raise money for charity with mm. it because it's it's one of those things. It, there's a few bits that haven't aged so well, so mm. so it's I would prov it's it's almost the sort of thing there. The limited number of people who'd be interested in it, mm. I would prefer it to raise money for a good cause than mm. to than to line our pockets. But but it, so even with that, I, the uh, Chris from Go Faster Stripe has done a brilliant job of editing that and making it look better mm. for uh, for in the 14 or 15 years since we filmed it. Mm. Um, so it's things like that that I'm still terrible at. Uh, but whereas it's almost that generational thing that that now, if I if I was 20 years younger, I, I would imagine I would have grown up with a better understanding. Mm. And even just, I, I've seen it with Kiri, because Kiri wrote on Russell's show for a long time, and she'd sit next to me and, and I'd be like struggling with an Instagram post. Uh, you know, and oh, how'd you put text on this? And then she'd just be like, you know, it's and it, yeah, yeah, in like in 20 seconds, she, she, she makes it look amazing. And that's where, and and it's obviously, like, again, I I have never been overly fussed about it, and I've been lucky in that I haven't had to, mm. but I'm certainly paying the price for that now, mm. that, that um, w me and Steve Williams are, are doing a, a talk. So me, Steve Williams, brilliant writer and comedian, and uh, we are doing some of the support slots for mm. Russell Howard on his tour at the moment. Mm. And Russell's suggestion was that we book our, we do our own little tour. Mm. So, so me and Stevie are doing a, a joint headline tour later mm. in the year. But the act of selling that to the punters at the at, at the gigs uh, involves a spiel that is like so challenging for me because I'm so bad at self promotion, <laughs> and so. Um, just chats with people who are younger and better. So Phil Chapman, I was having a chat to him, and he he had opened for, um, uh, I think for Paul Smith. Um, and he just he had a, a one of those post one of those posters that just you pull up mm -hmm. and it, his key thing was I've got a he's got a QR code mm -hmm. so they just they can scan the QR code and it will take them to where they can buy mm -hmm. tickets for his tour and he said as soon as he did that he got way more followers and way more ticket sales mm -hmm. so we've done that for this tour and it's revolutionized it mm -hmm. where where suddenly it, because our, our whole thing was we put in a date in a city where one of us is open for Russell mm -hmm. So Stevie uh, was opening for him in in Bristol, mm. and we've then got a tour date at the uh, the Alma Theatre mm. in 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 Bristol later in the year, 
and Steve sold out the show on the first night because the QR code mm. thing worked so well. And it was always that thing that people would be into us and they would sort of go, oh, yeah, I'll buy tickets. But then they would forget the name or just life gets in the way. Whereas that thing of getting them while they're, they've just, you know, they're literally where they're buying tickets mm. in the interval because mm. they go, oh, I love that bloke. Oh, yeah, let's hope. Oh, mm. and the QR code is so easy. But it is. It's, they're, they're, it's some, like in the same way that people obviously there's comedy courses mm. have been very successful mm. I don't know if, if there is like a social media course <laughs> for confused middle aged <laughs> comedians I think that would be a real money spinner <laughs> That's very funny. Um, talking about Russell Howard, how did you meet Russell Howard? Uh, so I met Russell. We were just on. It was all on the circuit. Partly, we, we I'd signed to Avalon mm. when I, I'd signed to Avalon very early. Yeah, I, that, sorry, but I'll yeah. go back. I'll come back to Russell. But how did yeah. you? How did you end up signing um, for Avalon? So I signed with Avalon. So the the Daily Telegraph Open Mic Award oh, that was a competition that was run by Avalon. So okay. the the semi finals of that gig would take place in student unions mm. that were Avalon student union nights. Um and so that's how you first get seen. Mm. Uh and so that's where you're you're first on their radar from that. Mm. And then their live desk on the back of the telegraph final mm. in Edinburgh that year, they gave me my first uh, support slots at their student union gigs. Yeah. And so it begin. That's where it begins to sort of slowly come together. And it, and it's again, it's amazing how supportive that world is. That the the heat that I did to get into the final of that. Mm. The very, you do a heat, and then if, if the heat goes well, you might. But you just it's just an open spot yeah. basically, and then you might get selected to be into one of the semi-finals. And I found it. So my heat for that was like my seventh ever gig. And it later emerged that the reason I got put through into the semi-final was Dan Antopolsky, the headline at that night, had phoned up the live desk and said, uh, wow. the open spot last night was excellent. Mm. So again, incredibly generous thing for him to do. But are but, we getting so excellent <laughs> oh, at seven? Have you just been thinking about comedy right Yeah, Yeah, I mean, think that was the thing. It's like ultra nerdy. <laughs> yeah, so it was, it's like a lot of pent-up energy, but mm. also I think the brilliance of Logan's course mm whatever Lo like logan's thing about finding what's funny about yourself mm. and and those basic exercises he teaches so the, what, I, what i still come back to it as a writing exercise if ever i'm blocked one of his things is write a list of 10 things you hate sincerely write a list of 10 things you love sincerely mm. but but empty your head of them don't just let it be like i hate something obvious mm. like like because the more quirky and idiosyncratic those things are the more of yourself you are re revealing mm. and sometimes the reason you hate a thing might be funny for its sheer stupidity or, mm. or illogicality or it might be that there's a funny story mm. behind why you hate this thing mm. so that that really opens stuff up mm. um and so there's a there's a one line i don't I, I sort of moved away from one liners but there was a joke that i wrote in that writing exercise that ended up in the days before Dave's best joke of the fringe, mm. there were a few other publications would do those best jokes and the, the independent put it in, put, put so the, the joke was I despise cliqueiness for reasons only my four closest friends will ever properly understand. Mm. And it was a really weird joke for that to, because so that'd been a, a one liner I'd literally written on the comedy course. What made it odd about them putting in as a best joke of the fringe was I didn't have it in my fringe. <laughs> So it the was guys so, were very good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it was like, I, I, and it, it was obviously I must have given it to something mm. for some PR thing at some point in the few in, in the past. But it, I read yeah. that earlier, by the way, in the research, and I was uh, very impressed. So that was it. <laughs> right, and in fact, it always made me laugh that the um, for some reason the the independent edited the word because technically cliqueiness is not the correct grammar grammatical word. Mm. The word is cliqueishness. Mm. So the editor changed it. To I despise cliqueishness for reasons only my four closest friends will ever properly understand. And now I was aware that <laughs> cliqueishness was the correct word, but I didn't say cliqueishness because it makes it sound like you're telling the joke in 1772. <laughs> so it's, it still boils my piss to this day. <laughs> well, that's what they mean, is a kid from a yeah, yeah. seven. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, and so so that's the thing. So you start doing those Avalon student gigs, and again, you're you'd be opening for. I remember like. Um, 
I would be opening for Andy Zaltzman quite a bit. Uh, and again, just it's so cool. And, he's, and again, he's so brilliant and such mm. a kind person and a lovely person to just chat to. Mm. And he was saying that when he first signed to Avalon, they had him opening for 60 or 70 gigs, opening for Stuart Lee. Mm. So it was, you 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 really felt like you were part of this kind of heritage. And you were, because that, that was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, um, and so that was the thing that I then did a couple with Russ. Uh, and in fact, we, the, like the first time we we didn't really get on that well. So we, uh, uh, um, we did a long drive, and I think he found me overly neurodiverse. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and then we became proper mates. He so we were we were sort of parallels. We always got on well. It was it wasn't like dislike or anything like that. Um, I think he just thought I was a weirdo. Um, and then. Uh, we did. We got nominated the same year, mm. and again, it was a uh, like a a brilliant year to be nominated in because mm. it was us, Paul Sinha, Phil Nickel, David O'Doherty, and and Russ. Uh, again, I mean, that's in terms of the history of the nominations. There is no women on that <laughs> list at all, so that's yeah. slightly doesn't age well that nomination list. But they were all, uh, you know, they're all all wonderful people. Mm. Um, and then we did we did Melbourne in 2007 and that's where we properly start to hang out that in those days Marrick and Greg wanted to go straight to, to the bar as soon as the show <laughs> finished they just wanted to get on it straight away whereas me and Russ would just prefer a meal mm. before we do that so we we would sort of we did a lot of just and that was because Melbourne has got such a brilliant food culture yeah we would just do a lot of eating and then we'd still go on we'd still meet up with the others afterwards just lie was, in the stomach first. Yeah, 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 it was exactly that it was I'm a bit of a lightweight I didn't, I didn't want to ruin my reputation puking in the middle of the bar um, and so we got on really well doing that and then I ended up my now wife um, I st uh, uh, she is Australian uh, and in October of that year Clang had done some gigs in Singapore mm. And I flew on, and it was like my trial month with my now wife to like let's see if this is going to be a proper relationship. <laughs> Few um, open spots, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And in fact, Greg at the time was recording the then unheard of first series of the In Betweeners, so it was wow. funny. How, um, and I got back from that first trip with with my now wife, uh, and Russell was doing his first mini tour, and he was miserable. And so, so someone at Avalon said, like, he's on his own. Mm. And it was basically him and the tour manager at the time. Mm. They clearly didn't like each other. Uh, and they were saying, so would you like your, you know, you're obviously, we still want you to do the gigs and mm. we, you are being employed because you've got jokes. But also, can you look after us a bit? Because he's <laughs> really, like, he's quite down in the dumps. Mm. At a time where it should be exciting. And I, so I arrive and I do, like, two weeks on the road. And it is the strangest dynamic where this tour manager clearly thinks he's shit. Uh, and, and so he's saying things on the, in the car. He's saying things like, oh, uh, the girlfriend and I, we went, to, we went to see Jason Manford. Now he is funny. Mm. And Russ is like, hang on a second. That's so mean because, like, number one, yes, Jason is brilliant. Like, like, but, but, like, trying to present it as if, like, there's a difference. Like, that's – and it's like, what, what are you – like, he's on stage in half an hour and you're yeah. saying that to him. Uh, and he would do things like he would play in. So Russell had like an upbeat guitar track as his walk on music and the tour manager would change it without warning him, mm. but would change it to weird things like the police Academy theme tune, which is a very slow pace. Da -da 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 -da. Mm. So it's completely bad for the gig. And it's like, it's a really, really weird thing to do. It's very uh, hard. I don't know what that's uh, and there were there were certain <laughs> nights where it emerged that like the tour manager would literally like go, "I'm getting tired now. You drive Russ." <laughs> and he, Russ would exhausted be from his yeah, performance. Yeah. So Russ is driving home <laughs> while the tour manager is snoring next to it. Yeah, he just fear yeah, off. Yeah. <laughs> and so I, yeah, I just was able to make Russ laugh and was and was like just trying to smooth things over. Mm. It, there was a brilliant thing where uh, we were doing a gig in Cumbria and the um, the tour <laughs> the tour manager, I mean, this is, I actually got on quite well with the tour manager. Sure <laughs> that, that made me feel guilty as well. I thought he was quite a nice bloke, but he, his mum and dad ran a guest house in Cumbria. Mm. And so he said, oh, to save money, rather than getting you a, a hotel, we'll stay at my mum's hotel. And we arrive and it becomes very obvious that his parents hotel is specifically for old people <laughs> like but like not as in thematically it is it is over 55 only uh, so there's there's, pla <laughs> yeah, there's plastic sheets on all the beds there's plastic sheeting and um 
we didn't eat in the breakfast place. We ate up with them in their little living quarters. Mm. And I died hard at the gig and and i'd like i'd done like a harold shipman joke or something like that and like the 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 dad is referring back to this and and russell has slagged off the daily mail and like the dad is like very pointedly like reading the daily mail going hope you don't mind this russell <laughs> I'm go, like this is and this is saved this probably saved him like 200 quid and we're having the most surreal experience we've ever had so it's um but yeah and so that was it and it sort of then led to writing opportunities when he was on Mot the Week, but also it was like, okay, well, there's enough of a friendship here. And again, we're stylistically different enough mm. that um, uh, it, the, the the gig works. Mm. And then it just led on to some really fun times. My, one of my favourite memories, This is, I think this is 2008, uh, what he would do in the 2008 tour, he would sort of get me in, involved if needed. So I would be on the offstage mic, and it was more like I would wait for him to cue me. And it was just sometimes like if he was bored or if he got a bit thrown by something, or in some cases if he hadn't heard what the audience member had said, because often he would kick off the encore by kind of going, uh, any questions? Mm. And so in 2008, uh, uh, in Bradford, this kid goes, uh, this kid shouts out, will you sign my shoe? <laughs> Uh, and Russ goes, yeah, yeah, throw it down. So the kid throws his shoe onto the stage and goes, right, Hawley, get on. So I come on and he, and he, and, uh, he goes, and he's just basically like the, the cue to me to do something funny with the shoe. So I start dancing with the shoe <laughs> and then I put the shoe down my pants <laughs> and I'm just, and I'm pretending to have sex with the shoe, but I'm, I'm like the full clang energy is coming out. I'm doing this far too aggressively. I'm really, I'm pounding away on this shoe uh, and I sort of roll over as if I'm spent, as if I've just <laughs> fetched and, um, and you hear this kid just go, I just want my shoe back. <laughs> and uh, and so I roll over and, and it's sticking out like that. It's sticking, it's sticking out the top. So Russ, I, I go to Russ to pull it. To, and Russ pulls the shoe out and somehow my cock and balls <laughs> come out at the same time because they'd somehow ended up in the sole. So they, they uh, in the footwell, if you will. Uh, and so... And we're so tired. Like, we've been on the road for – and there's 1,600 people in, in, in Bradford, and we're all laughing. It's like a moment of utter hysteria where we know the audience are happy with this. We're we're literally – we've completely lost our shit. And there's one kid who's, by this point, has gone to the stand by the stage Crying. just looking so fucking upset. Has <laughs> to wear the shoe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah, and so and that was always that thing of like trying to create that chaos. Mm. So there's a thing I don't think it's on. I don't. I, I'll have to. I don't think I sent you it, and I was going to send you it. My favourite clang bit of chaos mm. is uh, um, we were doing some warm up for the live show that's not been released, and we hadn't done the sketches for a while. And it, there's a sketch in which I kiss and lick Marrick's head, <laughs> and. Um, he in the time he'd started shaving his head a lot closer, so I get a pure hit of salt. Like it's <laughs> utter, it's so sweaty. It's like the saltiest thing I've ever taken. And I'd had a can of Coke before the show, uh, and um, I just puke on him. <laughs> and, and this is videoed where, like, and it's it's frothy Coca Cola y. Uh, so so, and you, and you can see it, and, and it's utter chaos where. Uh, I'm holding him. I'm so horrified. Greg is not aware that it's happening. So Greg's playing on the guitar. The audience are losing their damn minds. And Greg's clearly thinking, like, we are storming it tonight. Uh, and then Greg slowly works out what's happening. Uh, uh, Marek at some point storms off. Well, not storms off, but goes back to clearly to tidy himself up. And I have to say to Greg, I accidentally puked on Marek. <laughs> it's just joyful. Um and I love apparently when when we finished that sketch, we were all off stage. Marek turned to Greg and went, he did that on purpose. <laughs> but then uh, when he watched the video back later that night, he texted me to say, oh, that's the funniest thing I've ever seen. <laughs> but it was that, like, when you can get to that level of insanity. Was there, like, rules to build the chaos up or insanity? Like, how did you – or just There fun? were certain – because there was a loose structure mm. – um, there were little cues we could give each other. So, so, uh, and there's almost like areas where you can do it. Mm -hmm. So that when they would do uh, the, um, that Greg would play a magician called mm -hmm. Darren Chilblain and mm -hmm. 
Now it would be the hapless stooge. And they there were that was the two of them. Mm. And there were things in that. So that sketch, the sketch as written would be 11 minutes long, mm. but they could fuck about. And it, so there were nights where that sketch would be 20 minutes long. Mm. Uh, and depending on the mood and depending on how naughty they were feeling, you could sort of see where it would go. And there, there were individual bits where they could, like individual moments where they know like, okay, this is an opportunity to fuck about, mm. but we could also just barrel on. Uh-huh. So so there was another one. Uh, we had a, the World Insult Championships mm. and a round in that would, would be the audience nomination round where we would go into the crowd and get them to shout stuff at us. And um, there, was a, there was a logic to it in that at the end of the sketches, basically somewhat – a member of the audience would say something really mild mm. and we would then act act utterly offended. <laughs> and I I had to pick the person and I had this knack of getting I could pick someone who I knew was going to say something weak and it was like this it was this weird sort of spider sense where <laughs> 95% of the time it would work. Uh but every now and then I would pick someone who looked incredibly timid who would then say the most horrendous thing. <laughs> And so there were little cues we could give each other, like, oh, okay, well, we can't end on that. So so it's even just like a little, you know, mm. spin-on hand gesture. So there was a girl once, she was like 15, and I thought there's no way she's going to say anything bad. And she looked at Marek and said, you are a failed abortion. <laughs> so so it, it's like absolutely remarkable. We're, me and Greg are high-fiving her. <laughs> but that's one where you know that you carry on, you enjoy the chaos of it, but you then – you then have to keep the sketch going to to find um, f- find a good way to end it. Because I love when acts cultivate chaos, so it was just, I guess, just to have fun. It was yeah, just yeah. fun was the main rule. Yeah, yeah. For you and it's quite, because I'm very, I'm quite deadpan and, and static as a stand-up. Mm-hmm. So it was as a way of like encouraging me to sort of let go of the balloon a bit more. Because like often the weirdest gigs come out of nowhere, where there, mm-hmm. it might be there's, uh, even just in normal stand-up, um, that whatever happens, it's like, you know, the first time something happens to disrupt your set, mm. because when you're new, you're like, I've got my five minutes, and I, if I get, if I forget it, I'm gonna have to start all over again in my head. <laughs> so, so that thing of like, if something goes wrong or something goes weird, being able to sort of go, okay, well, let's deal with this, let's mm. drink all we can from this, and mm. then move on, but not I'd be like, I need to get back to normal again. <laughs> and so that was very useful to mm. me. So, so one of the weirdest gigs I ever did doing stand up, I was doing a gig in Prague. It was just before Christmas, and uh, there was a the the compare was a, a local Czech. I don't think he was even a comic. I think he might have just been a promoter, and he he said he was going to do some warm up and then bring me on. Um, and it emerged he wasn't doing any material or any crowd work. He got four people out of the crowd, and it and he said that this was a traditional Czech Christmas game where he uh, he got a big bowl mm. and he got small pieces of fruit. Uh, of dried fruit, and he soused them in alcohol, okay. uh, like 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 a loads of alcohol, and he then set light to the fruit it, it, with the alcohol, uh, and the game was they had to uh, eat as many of the pieces of fruit as they could, and whoever <laughs> could eat the most pieces of fruit would would be the winner. Uh, and so, but it's fucking burning, like, and, and so it's this weird game where he does that. Um, uh, and then they're literally putting like burning or <laughs> molten fruit into their mouth. Uh, and then he declares a winner and then instantly goes, now please welcome your first act, <laughs> Steve Hall. Uh, and of course, four people in the audience can't applaud because they've just very severely burnt their hands. <laughs> and so that's one of those things where the sheer chaos of that, like it felt like the clang training had helped with that, <laughs> where you can sort of go, okay, well, this needs some dealing with. And even, you know, I think I said something cheesy like, you know, when he said it was going to warm up the audience. Oh, you that's know, great to be fair. But yeah, so it's it's that, it's always interesting. Like, it's like, like I used to, yeah, my instinct used to be to like run away from chaos, mm-hmm. where it's actually done the right way. If, if as long as it's good hearted and it's mm-hmm. not someone just being a cunt or trying to ruin the gig, mm-hmm. that uh, yeah, it can be really joyful. That's very good. And with the riding with you and Russell, how how does a typical session work? Do you both come with ideas? Uh, well, it's it's more because it's for the TV show, yeah. Um, and so there's always a group of us. Okay. So so uh, uh, with there's within the writers room, mm. there'd be you know four or five people. Mm. But we'd also benefited from a brilliant research team. Mm. 
So so whatever there'd be stuff that would be sent through from the week, mm. from the week's news, and often bits of footage chopped up, but also part of the job when you're working on the TV show would be you keep an eye out for wacky stories. Mm. And so often, or you might do a paper trawl mm. as well as, but you're looking for something to jump off. Mm. Um, and and you'd pitch them. And, and obviously it has to appeal to Russ. So sometimes you might be convinced that some, so I remember me and Steve Williams, when Jussie Smollett, when that story broke a couple mm. of years ago, uh, we had to pitch that about six times to Russ before mm. he finally went with it mm. um and then we were and then when uh when dave Chappelle then covered it we were quite pleased that we'd sort of yeah, we'd had, of yeah yeah um but but and so it is that it's, but it's almost like the skill with those things it's it's much it's quite similar to writing on your own but it's just it's writing at speed mm. uh and with clarity uh and and conciseness because it's so fraught and, and because the news cycle moves on so quickly mm. and partly because Russ, by his own confession, is ADHD as far, <laughs> that, that you're trying to do it in a way that appeals to him. And mm. so it's it's interesting. There are certain jokes I always thought cemented my place that there was, there was one summer where it was just me and him in the right. It was early prep for the series mm. and it was just me and him. But it was also my first time. It was like my first full series. So I felt mm. like I still needed to prove myself. And there was a story about a bloke who'd – he had had a heart attack and passed away while having a threesome with his wife uh, and uh, his wife's best friend. Mm. And so it's a silly story. And one of the jokes I'd pitched was he died doing what he loved and her friend. <laughs> And, <laughs> and so that's the sort of thing where that just comes like that's just a normal like you would you know you're doing your your you know the the spider diagrams we yeah. all draw but you're doing that at speed but and and sort of almost telepathically where you just you're aware we've got five minutes of this and and that was always the thing that you can that when there's an uh, when there's trust in the room. Mm -hmm. You can swing and miss, and it's not a problem. Mm. That that it might be that you get fuck all on a subject, and in some cases, it might even be that we've all written the same joke. Mm. And when when you're first on the show, you always want to go like, I I'd written it as well, Russ. I'd, uh, honest, but <laughs> and then you realise that Russ he trusts you. Like mm. it's not a problem mm. that. And so sometimes, yeah, just depending which order we go around the room, it might be that whoever <laughs> said it. First. But, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, so there was there was one again. It was a joke. This was the joke that I felt got me the job. It was um, I was writing before I was f fully in the writers' room. I was mm. just doing. I was emailing stuff in, uh, and they were stuck on a joke. There was a thing. Ken Livingston was being investigated because it turned out that he'd been paying his wife as an employee, mm. and it was unclear whether this was legal or not. And there was a clip from him where he just said, "I just had her working in the attic." <laughs> So it's a funny, weird thing to say, but they couldn't find a one-liner mm. to 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 come off of to to reply to that. And so one of the things I'd pitch was whenever I think I attic for me, mm. I automatically think of Anne Frank. Mm. Like that's just, and again, that's it's not massively original thought, mm. but it's it's like a trigger, and it's partly I think um, there's an apocryphal story from from a play about Anne Frank in New York in the 80s mm. that's so shit that um, when uh, when the Nazis arrive at the end of the play, a member of the audience shouts out, she's in the attic. <laughs> okay. So it's an apocryphal showbiz yeah. story. But that's one of the reasons I always think of it. Mm. So when I hear the word attic, I'd pitched an attic. What's he, what's he, what, bi what business is he running? The Anne Frank experience. <laughs> and that then was the first joke of that episode. And it felt like, oh, that's basically the joke that got me the job. And then uh, with your stand up, how does the writing process differ? It's um, part. It's changed slightly because most topical things go to Russ. So, okay. for, so for a long time, I haven't really been that topical a stand up because mm. anything you do, even if I'm trying it in stand up, I'm doing it with a view to pitching it for the show mm. or saying to Russ, if you want this, like this mm. fits what you do. And particularly because like when you're on tour with him, he, you don't, you have to avoid crossover of subjects. Mm. So uh, mine has become more storytelling mm. just because of that. Uh, and so it's this combination of like knowing you're keep, keeping an eye out for that. Um, but then also like I prefer, I quite enjoy that sort of anecdotal style I really mm. like. 
but then it's also that's then a framework to hang you can hang a bit of observational off of it or a few puns or a few one-liners mm. um and again it's almost like when you're that obsessed with comedy you sort of know if something is new or if it's mm. if something's been done a million times mm. so uh so there'll be things you know like particularly as a parent like it mm. it becomes it's slightly difficult to avoid writing stuff about being a parent mm. but it's also that's i fit in with that de that demographic that as a, a fairly obviously middle-aged man mm. um an audience that you know people my age and the audience quite like hearing those stories mm. and because some of the stories are quite sweet even the younger people are like oh that's a nice story about his mm. kids but it's often yeah i'm always looking for some sort of autobiographical thing to to base it off of and then but and then, and then seeing you fill where it, it up goes. with just laughs yeah yeah, yeah. And, and in some cases like it's it's always tricky when it, when you can t you, when you are aware that you're doing a thing that is then becoming done by everyone so i for for quite a while mm. because i am i'm aware i'm an awkward like physicality of mr bean type person mm. so I, i've often had stuff about me being awkward or being a loser or being neurotic mm. but now we're in the age where everyone's talking about anxiety it's like it's tricky because i don't want to look like i'm lazily jumping on a mental health bandwagon mm. so it's trying to present my stuff about being anxious but in a way that doesn't feel like i'm like going hey guys <laughs> i've seen what you young people are doing <laughs> us old guys can be neurotic too and what's the worst piece of advice you hear like comedian stand-ups or sketch artists whatever what, what what's the worst piece of advice you think um, they're told the uh there's a vogue at the moment and and again, there are some people who think that me me feeling this way mm. is an indication that I am an old, uh, an out, you know, confused, past it idiot. <laughs> there there is a vogue now for people thinking that they don't gain anything from watching shows. Mm. So you, you see, there'll be people who like they they do their set and then they fuck off. Mm. And I used to love both from an a, an enjoyment point of view and a learning point of view. You know, I did I did. Uh, the one time I was ever on a bill where Malcolm Hardy was emceeing mm. uh, uh, and I had a good gig and uh, Malcolm was lovely afterwards and did it, shall I book him? Oh, yeah, I'll book him, I'll book him. <laughs> uh, um, and then Kitson was headlining. And it was the first, it was the, oh, no, that's not the first time I'd seen him. But I'd seen him a couple of times, but it was this amazing thing where I've, I'm getting to see Kitson fuck about at Up the Creek mm. on a night where I've been on the bill. I've been on the same, you know, it's so <laughs> exciting. And I learned so much, whereas there is this vogue now where people seem to think that that doesn't matter so much. And and I'm aware there is a thing that getting back from gigs, there are good reasons why people might need to leave a gig mm. early because they might have to work or it's just not a particularly pleasant area to get back home from or mm. whatever it might be. But there does seem to be, some people seem to think that you don't need to watch mm. the other comics anymore. Mm. And it's just, it's such a missed opportunity. Mm. And counter the end of that, but not the opposite. Obviously, what yeah. what's the best piece of advice you think you could give to the? Um, that's interesting. I th it's remember to enjoy it. Mm. it. It's it's probably because because now because it's so crowded, mm. and there are lots of there are so many wrong turns you can take and there are so many people who are business minded from the from the outset mm. so they're looking you know th it's their first gig and they're already filming it and they're already looking for <laughs> quotes and so it ends up becoming it it can become quite mechanical mm. and quite joyless and it can so, so we had that with certainly with the sketch show where you would get when we were first doing sketches we were aware we were entering a world of actors mm. who were doing sketches but didn't really care about comedy. They were, mm. they were doing it to get their – they were showcasing their voices. Like, Here's my Scottish voice. Here's my working class voice. And it was – they would <laughs> get – real. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it was like so they could get advertising things. Mm. And there were brilliant people in mm. that Orman meeting. They were genuinely brilliant people. Mm. But if we were in this world, like, and we were doing it to have a laugh. We mm. were doing it – I was doing it to emulate the Doug Anthony All-Stars. Mm. And yet it felt too businesslike. Mm. And you can see that there are people who are very, very businesslike, whereas – I, lo I love it when you meet someone who's just fucking excited to be there and they just love jokes and they but it is yeah just that thing of remembering preserving that element of joy mm. it's is and, and that I feel like that leads not only is that good creatively but also you just make better friends like you end up like I, I 
I I have worked with a lot of people and I think one of the things that one of the reasons I've worked with quite a lot of people is just that I'm quite a sort of benign presence like I'm <laughs> fairly easy to get on with I'm, I'm I'm basically I'm a good little beta I'm, a, I'm not an alpha male and so, and so I get on well enough with people that I've been l very lucky mm. to work with some amazing talent mm. but crucially I don't make that talent feel threatened so, <laughs> That's very good. And then um, if you could form like a super comedian out of, say, three of your favorite comics, what would you take from them and who would who oh, would you take from? That's a really interesting question. Um, I, it's it's so tricky because obviously, like, if you say mates, it's like... It's, it's like <laughs> no, I think it's fair because it you, um, you know a lot of people. Uh, I absolutely love Patton Oswalt's delivery. Like, like his in terms of, like... Things where I've sort of gone, I would love where I've where I've made a conscious shift. Mm. His, his, in particular, Werewolves and Lollipops. Mm. That's one of the all time great uh, specials, I think. Where where and his just it, the, his use of language is so beautiful. But there's, the way he he modulates his voice, there's sing song bits, there's silly bits, there's bits where he's just making silly noises, mm. and so it's just completely captivating. Uh, and he's just he's a pleasure to spend time in his company. So so his delivery probably I, you can't really like Mal Malaney's jokes just cuz yeah and it's you don't really need to say more than that. It's just, it's just, <laughs> and then um uh and it's tricky because in terms of the perfect comic the the charisma of either Greg or Kitson or David O'Doherty, like like, like the, the the charm and ease with which they uh, they own the stage is uh, like and and that's and they're all I mean they 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 all they are all charismatic in very different mm. ways, mm. Uh, but it's just like that you just look forward. It's like hanging out with a friend. Like mm. it's it's um magical. Well, well, thank you for so much for coming. That was amazing. Thank you. Um, what are the socials? Uh, so it's. At a Steve Hall yeah. on, on Twitter and Instagram. And the tour? And, uh, the tour is like November. Uh, this, so this is a good example of how bad it, uh, so, social media <laughs> yeah, is. It's in your bio as well, isn't well, it? Well, it's in my bio, but my link is Steve Williams' <laughs> <laughs> website. Yeah, this is how bad <laughs> I am at it. That the, 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 To buy the tickets, <laughs> it's all on Steve Williams' website, which is... Uh, oh, the, the, I really enjoyed that. That was very, very insightful and very funny. Thank you so much. Um, for everyone, if you've enjoyed it, please uh, give a five-star on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, and the new clips will be posted on Kid and Podcasts, so please share. And please go see the, the tour. If there's a date available near you, um, we're going to yeah. find out the link in the bio. And shall I, can I advertise? I advertise the, everything. So the what there's I've got I've only got two clips on YouTube. <laughs> one of which I don't like. The older one mm. I'm not fond of for reasons mm. I won't bore you with because I could talk for five minutes about that. Mm. But um, the second one, the, so the one from the one that was put up in like 2019, something like that, mm. uh, where I it, where it's the one where it's pictures of me meeting the Muppets when I was a kid. <laughs> That's that's the thing. If if people might be interested in seeing the show, in seeing the tour, there's a mm. ten minute clip of me, and it's the story of when I met the Muppets, and that, and that's one of the few things you, I'm proud you've of. Sold the ticket. Well, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, we'll we'll try to figure out a way. If you post more reels, we'll post it by the time I figure it out. I don't know. We'll figure out something. But thank you so much for coming. Cheers. Steve. Thank you. I really for appreciate me. it. Thank you.